bound upon me, rush upon me, I will overcome you by enduring your onset. Whatever strikes against that which is firm and unconquerable merely injures itself by its own violence. Seneca When does the sensation of being conquered arise within you? Is it triggered when another country seizes control of your own? Or do you find yourself conquered when an adversary takes possession of your home and all your belongings? Perhaps the feeling of defeat emerges when you're imprisoned with your hands and feet bound, or when someone unexpectedly snatches away your chance to pursue a romantic interest. This experience likely varies for each individual in terms of how circumstances prompt a sense of being overcome. The ancient Stoics, in their wealth of insights, delved into the art of achieving unconquerability. They held the belief that external forces cannot truly conquer a person unless that individual surrenders their authority over their own faculties. The sole pathway through which external factors can impact us is when we, by our own volition, allow them in. When we sense that something has defeated us, it is essentially us defeating ourselves by succumbing to it. The pursuit of unconquerability doesn't require us to conquer the entire world, but rather to conquer ourselves. This video explores Stoic philosophy on how to become unconquerable. The way we estimate external things decides how they influence us, not the things in themselves. If we attribute a high value to something, there's a risk that we develop a desire for it. If we then encounter what we desire, we feel elated, which is of course a great feeling. But when we somehow can't get what we want, we don't feel so great. And thus, we've put our emotional state at the mercy of outside circumstances. Imagine you're genuinely attracted to someone at your workplace or school. After mustering the courage to approach them and successfully arranging a date, you'll likely be on cloud nine. However, if this person unexpectedly cancels the date at the last moment, you'll find yourself disappointed and possibly even upset. Although situations involving flaking, rejection or being dumped are common in the dating world, people's responses can vary significantly. Some individuals simply shrug off such occurrences and continue with their lives, while others respond by harboring resentment or seeking revenge. Should rejection trigger a powerful emotional response within us, we could infer that this event has managed to conquer our emotional state. And you can't be like that. This power to influence our emotional well-being and potentially shape our actions is also present when it comes to insults. If seemingly minor insults manage to nurture days of lingering resentment, it's as if the person who delivered the insult has effectively conquered the one insulted. However, there exist far more profound ways through which people can gain influence over us, beyond mere insults or rejection. One such example is manipulation through blackmail. A commonly employed form of blackmail involves the threat of tarnishing one's reputation. Since many individuals hold their reputation dear, they might easily succumb to such tactics. In such cases, if someone yields to this pressure, the one resorting to blackmail has successfully conquered their target. Another example is interrogation accompanied by imprisonment and even torture, which was common practice in the Roman Empire. The effectiveness of these methods depends on how attached someone is to one's body and how much pain he's willing to suffer. The Stoics say that we always have a choice, even in such horrible circumstances. If we knuckle under the actions of our torturer, we've made a choice to be conquered by him. But if we refuse to give in despite the severity of the torments, the torturer may damage our bodies but fails to defeat us. We are often troubled, but not crushed, sometimes in doubt, but never in despair. In the Discourses of Epictetus, an extensive collection of lectures by the two end-century Stoic philosopher, we find him emphasizing repeatedly the unassailable nature of an individual's capacity to choose, 
alternatively translated as moral choice by certain scholars. Regardless of the circumstances at hand, even in the face of the most dire situations, we retain the agency to either retain control over our actions or succumb to the surrounding conditions. Epictetus illustrates the potency of this ability by recounting his response to a hypothetical scenario in which a tyrant threatens him. Should he declare, I will confine you in chains, my retort would be, he is menacing my hands and my feet. When he asserts, I will execute you, I would reply, he is endangering my neck. If his declaration turns to, I will cast you into prison, I would counter, he is endangering my entire meager body. And even if he employs the threat of exile, my response remains unchanged. Epictetus illustrates in this passage that even though the tyrant tries to exercise power over him, he remains unconquerable. Sure, the tyrant can chain his legs, chop his head or throw him into prison, but these are simply outside factors that aren't up to him, and thus, according to Epictetus, they're nothing to him. What counts are his actions, and no one but ourselves can decide these. If we want to be unconquerable, we need to be willing to endure any hardship. We need to be prepared to dismiss entirely what others might think of us, to be willing to forfeit all that we possess, even our most fundamental necessities, to endure the confinement and mistreatment of our bodies, and even to bid farewell to those we hold dear. Every potent attachment we harbor, whether it's an unwavering connection we are hesitant to sever, or something we cannot bear and won't tolerate, possesses the capacity to destabilize and sway our choices. The prime illustration of unconquerability is found in the story of psychiatrist and philosopher Viktor Frankl, who endured three grueling years of captivity within various Nazi concentration camps. In his work, Man's Search for Meaning, Frankl recounts how Jewish prisoners were coerced into assisting prison guards, committing heinous acts against their own comrades in exchange for food and improved treatment. Frankl astutely observed how individuals were quick to succumb to the brutal circumstances, willing to do whatever it took to survive, even if it meant betraying or mistreating others. However, a distinct group refused to allow the circumstances to dictate their values, continuing to exhibit acts of kindness and compassion. Thus, while the Nazis could subject these individuals to imprisonment, torture, starvation, and even extermination, they remained unvanquished. Seneca stated that hardships aren't the problem but our surrendering to them is. Therefore, a Stoic sage will not be disturbed by hardships, which means they can't touch him. What element of evil is there in torture and in the other things which we call hardships? It seems to me that there is this evil, that the mind sags and bends and collapses. But none of these things can happen to the sage. He stands erect under any load. Nothing can subdue him. Nothing that must be endured annoys him. For he does not complain that he has been struck by that which can strike any man. He knows his own strength. He knows that he was born to carry burdens. Undoubtedly, the Stoic sage's ideal state is formidable and nearly unattainable. Just as with any profound aspiration, cultivating a heightened unconquerability in the Stoic context necessitates persistent practice. The ancient Stoics recognized this challenge, but spurred themselves and others to strive for improvement. However, maintaining unwavering rationality at all times can be demanding, given that our rational faculties often struggle to fully contain our emotions. The ancient Stoics astutely observed that emotional responses often precede our ability to intervene, even causing sages to be momentarily taken aback. This led them to differentiate between the passions and emotions. According to Stoic teachings, we exert influence over our passions, distress, fear, lust and delight. The Stoic sage is ideally immune to passions. However, most of us aren't sages and are bound to experience passions at least intermittently. Fortunately, even in the grip of our passions, we retain the capacity to choose. 
even if we find ourselves prostrate, overcome by emotion, and to a certain extent conquered, we still maintain the ability to determine our subsequent actions. Thus, we might suggest that various defense lines can be breached by external influences, with the ultimate boundary being our capacity to choose. Should someone breach this final line, they would have indeed fully conquered us. Therefore, to attain unconquerability, we must safeguard our lines of defense. In this analogy, our ability to fend off the assaults of passions can be fortified through reason and restraint. We can defend the line of our choice or moral choice with the same weapons, but it's going to be a bit more challenging when the first battle line is taken. If the enemy conquers our emotional state, they will influence our decision-making. For example, when there's a strong desire, we're more likely to base our decision on it, or when we're angry, we're more likely to act out. So when the enemy stands on our doorstep, we need firepower to defend our ability to choose. We might liken this firepower to our intrinsic resilience, the ability to make sound decisions, even in the face of overwhelming emotions. An illustration of this can be found in the film Lord of the Rings, where Frodo takes on an exceedingly daunting task to transport the One Ring to Mordor and cast it into the fires of Mount Doom. The peril of the One Ring lies in its capacity to forge a potent attachment between itself and its bearer. Consequently, the person wearing the ring becomes so obsessed with it that he'll do anything to prevent separation. Frodo indeed grows attached to his so-called precious, just like Gollum, who's trying to take it from him. Now, although Frodo did give in to his attachment at the very end, he was able to carry the ring for thousands of miles, overcoming countless moments of temptation. Most other characters would have probably surrendered to the ring much earlier, like Boromir, for example. Once more in accordance with Stoic philosophy, there exists only one element genuinely susceptible to conquest, our power of choice. All else resides beyond our influence and is subject to the caprices of fate. Our possessions, be they riches, our autonomy or our standing, can all slip away, succumbing to the unpredictable turns of fortune. However, our capability to shape our beliefs, to yearn, to harbor resentment, to embrace, to refrain, to converse or to remain silent, endures as an indelible part of us. As Viktor Frankl astutely phrased it, when we find ourselves unable to alter a circumstance, we are presented with the challenge of transforming ourselves. That's all for today. Please make sure you're subscribed. If you don't, join us. Thank you for your time and attention.